Please join me in welcoming Mr. Tony Seba. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thanks so much for that introduction. Thank you, Seattle, for having me. Um, today, I want to take you into the future. Not, not 20, 30, 40 years from now, but the next 5, 10, 15 years. But before I do that, I want to take you into the past. This is downtown New York City, 1900, in a sea full of horses. Can anyone see the one car in this picture? I'll give you a book. No, there is one car in this picture. There. It doesn't even look like a car. Um, 13 years later, same place, New York, Fifth Avenue, can anyone see the one horse in this picture? This is a disruption, a technology-based disruption. Uh, and in New York City and in a lot of cities downtown, it took just 13 years. When disruptions happen, they happen very quickly. So what is a disruption? That's my work. It's when new technologies and services essentially make it possible for companies to disrupt, to destroy existing markets, and at the same time, create new markets. And we've all known disru recent disruptions, the cell phone, um, the uh, personal computer, which disrupted any number of, of, of industries, the iPod, which disrupted CDs, and so on and so forth. Um, and what happens with disruption is that it's usually the experts and the insiders who will tell you uh, it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen anytime soon. It could not possibly happen in 13 years. That's nuts, right? Um, so it's the experts who will tell you that. And this is a case study in what the experts will tell you. This is 1985. Um, the largest telecom company in the world, back then, AT&T, hired management consultant McKinsey. And they asked him one question. In 15 years, what's going to be the adoption for the cell phone in America? In 15 years. So McKinsey went off, and they came back with the number. 900,000. 900,000. The actual number was? This is not a small mistake, right? The smartest kids from the smartest business schools in the nation were off by 120 times. And that's what happens with disruption, or when you don't see the disruption coming. And of course, at the time, by AT&T not getting into the cell phone business, they were disrupted, the landline telephony, whatever that is, right? Some of you don't even know what that is. Um, and um, they also did not, by not getting into the cell phone market, they missed out on multi-trillion dollar opportunities. So um, I took the concepts of disruption and applied them to energy and transportation. And essentially, this is what um, uh, I predict, and this is what I came up with. One of the key disruptive technologies of the next few years is the self-driving car. And let me show you right a video. Right here in America, we're introducing the world's first truck with an AV license plate. The first autonomous truck on public roads ever, anywhere in the world. Germany's Daimler rolled out the Inspiration Tuesday night. It has been granted so license Mercedes already has, Nevada. this is legal, in Nevada, a uh, self-driving truck. It's already working. And highways. Nevada is one of four states and the District of Columbia that allow autonomous vehicle testing on public roads. A Daimler spokesperson said it that works. opted for Nevada Look, man, no hands. had strong and clear no regulations hands. for acquiring. Delphi built a car and not then drive it coast to, to coast. The self-driving Mercedes-Benz future truck 2025 um, Google has built a car and it's driven it a million and a half miles without a single accident. Actually, without causing a single accident. Human drivers have hit it 19 times. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
Tesla, every new Tesla that's coming out of Fremont is essentially 90%, 90% uh, self-driving. We can't use all of it uh, because of regulations, but it's mostly there. The technology is mostly there. And the CEO of Tesla says that within two years, they'll be fully self-driving, meaning you can get in your car and go to sleep, and it'll take you where you want to go, essentially, within two years. And pretty much every large conventional car company has also announced some sort of fully self-driving car by 2018 to 2020. So this is imminent. The technology is almost there. Uh, what about the cost? And this is something that the experts will tell you. Um, you know, it's too expensive or whatever. So this is what a self-driving car sees um, using a, a sensor called LiDAR. So a LiDAR is, you know, the little hat on that Google car is the LiDAR. It emits about a million pulses of laser per second, which bounce back like a radar, um, and then it has a supercomputer that crunches all that data and then decides, yeah, this is a little cat crossing the road, this is a little, this is a person, this is a tree, and so on and so forth, right? So in 2012, when Google announced the cost of its uh, self-driving car, they said it's $150,000. So what did the experts say at the time? Not gonna happen, right? Not in this lifetime. Um, and the LiDAR was almost half of that, $70,000. So what happened? Here's what happened. Within a year, the cost of the next generation LiDAR went down to 10 k Within the next year, I had the CEO of a Silicon Valley company in my class say, yep, we're building a $1,000 LiDAR. $1,000. But wait, there's more. Last month, that same company announced a $250 LiDAR. So essentially, LiDAR will have gone from 70,000 to 250 bucks within four or five years. Right? That's called exponential technologies. All of these technologies that make self-driving work are exponentially in decreasing in cost. Uh, and by the way, the next gen from this company is gonna be the size of a postage stamp, and it's gonna cost $90. 90, you can put it on your iPhone, all right? I don't know what you're gonna do with it, but you, <laughs> you could, right? And this is something that just a few years ago cost 70 grand. What about the cost of supercomputing? Because you do need a supercomputer. Now, let me take you back in time to 2000, Y2K. Um, this was the world's most powerful supercomputer in the year 2000. It cost about $50 million, and it had one teraflops, whatever that is. One teraflops was a lot of flops. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you could do a lot of artificial intelligence with that. Um, now, last year, a company called NVIDIA um, announced a two teraflops computer that you can hold in your hands, two teraflops, for about 50 bucks. That's only in 15 years. So the cost of supercomputing has gone from the size of a room and 50 million bucks to a few hundred bucks. Okay, so the technology cost is going down exponentially. And this, by the way, is built for self-driving cars. Now, cost is not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be on the order of all leather seats. Um, but is the market ready? Are you ready? I mean, I, I know I am, but are you ready? So Cisco did a study around the world that essentially found this. In countries like Brazil, 95% of consumers are saying, bring it on right now just right now, okay? In India, 86%. In China, 70%. So even if we're not ready, even if Seattle is not ready, even if San Francisco is not ready, countries that are about half of the world population are ready for this technology. Someone is gonna make it happen. Now, why are they ready? I'm guessing that this is why, right? And I'm sure Seattle is no different um, on a good day, so. Um, okay, this is all cool. We can do Facebook and Twitter and email and 
who knows what else when we not drive. Um, what's the disruptive impact? Here's the disruption. The disruption is gonna be when you combine car as a service with self-driving. And what is car as a service? Well, let me go back and give you a few numbers. Cars are your second largest capital expenditure. After your home, you spend $40,000, $50,000 in a car, uh, and yet, where is your car now? It's parked. We leave cars parked 96% of the time. What a waste of assets. I mean, 4% asset utilization is a disruption waiting to happen. The other thing is that we think we don't have enough highways, but well, we have too many. Uh, what happens actually is 95% of highway surface we don't use because we're distracted. We leave too much space in between cars and we're, you know, talking on the, well, we're not, we don't talk on the phone, right? Somebody else does. Um, um, and, you know, we're listening to the radio, we're thinking about whoever. Um, it turns out that autonomous cars can use uh, space when they drive four times more efficiently than we do because they have these uh, sensors and because they know exactly what the speed should be in between cars and so on and so forth, essentially, you can pack four times as many cars, autonomous, in the same space as uh, driving as you could when they're human driven. So, this is my car. Uh, for eight years, I have not owned a car. Um, I use Zipcar, I use Uber, I use Lyft, I use public transportation. Essentially, for me, my iPhone is my car. And, and that's, that's a change from um, even 10 years ago. So car sharing, you know what that is, Zipcar, um, Car2Go, and so on and so forth. I'll give you one number that they give. For every Zipcar, um, they have 15 members. That is, there are 14 cars off the road for each zip car. That's what happens when you share the car. Now, the ride sharing concept, which is Uber, um, essentially, I'm not gonna tell you much, but one thing about Uber and Lyft and so on, half of Uber rides right now in San Francisco are car sharing, meaning if I go from A to B, Uber tells me, look, if we pick up somebody on the way, it, your ride will cost you 30, 40% less. You wanna do that. The market is saying that when the costs go down like that, yeah, they're gonna say yes. So let's put all that together. Self-driving plus car sharing, this is what you get. Uber has announced that they're building their own self-driving car. Now, they may or may not build it in the end, but the concept that we're gonna have cars running around all day and night, um, Uber, Lyft, whoever it is that, who's gonna run these, and never park. Remember, when you have self-driving, they'll never park unless they have to recharge, which they'll probably do at three in the morning somewhere, right? So when you combine these, this is what I call car as a service, uh, essentially you can have a car to take you from home to work, from work to the bar, from the bar to whatever, um, anytime uh, for about a tenth of the cost. For about a tenth of the cost. We spend $12,000, we Americans, a year in owning a car. When you combine self-driving and car sharing, the cost is gonna go down by 90% which means that we're gonna save about $11,000 per year by not owning a car and getting the same level of service. Um, which means that the concept of car ownership is gonna be obsolete. And it also means another thing. We don't need parking, especially in the downtown. I mean, you think that there's no parking downtown, there's too much parking in downtown. And 90% of that, boom is gonna open up over the next 10 to 15 years because we're not going to need it. Now, when we go from um, uh, park, uh, uh, cars being parked 90% of the time to being driven 90% of the time, essentially downtowns are not gonna need parking. 
90%. We have 100,000 parking spaces public in the downtown uh, Seattle area, gone, right? 18 million square feet of land, we're gonna get back. What are we gonna do with that? Green, yes. Affordable housing, yes. Businesses, yes. So as a society, we need to decide what we wanna do with all that space. Because we're gonna need 80% fewer cars, 80 to 90% fewer parking spots. And this is a once in a lifetime, once in a century opportunity to radically transform not just transportation, but what a city is, what the, what the core, what we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape the cities, to going from parks, parking, to parks. So let me summarize this. This is 2016, and we're here. Okay, the one self-driving car that's going around and you don't even notice is there. Uh, a lot of people tell you this is not gonna happen or it's gonna happen uh, who knows when, uh, but it's, we're on the cusp. We're on the cusp of one of the major disruptions, one of the, the biggest disruptions of uh, the last 100 years. Over the next five to 15 years, all cars will be electric. So we're gonna go from gasoline to electric, from human driven to uh, self-driving, and from owning to car sharing. And when you have that combination, the number of cars is gonna shrink by 80%, the number of parking spots gonna shrink by 90%, and we're gonna have the opportunity to redesign our cities. We're gonna have cleaner, healthier and wealthier cities. Um, and the cities that lead these clean disruptions are gonna be the ones who attract the companies and the talent who are gonna lead the 21st century. And this is not really in the future, this is happening right now. Thank you.